Hey guys, and welcome back to the channel. So, are Korea and Japan besties now? Are we friends? Some of you may not have even known that at the very least we were frenemies. Why? Because of ongoing disputes, real disputes, between the two countries over land and claims, but the unresolved trauma of World War II and even before during Japanese colonialism and the interpretation of what counts as an apology. So if you've ever been in a family kind of conflict and parts of the family maybe generations ago said they apologize for something but you know people are still carrying wounds or even today even today in the United States why do you see people still carrying that confederate flag I don't think a lot of us realize that a lot of people, even in the United States, have not healed from that trauma. Um, yes, I mean, most of us would probably side with, well, yeah, we needed to end that. But on the other hand, if that was taken from you, there is a trauma there that needs to be resolved and if it's not it does get passed down during uh, throughout the generations so i wanted to go over what was this landmark deal this so-called landmark deal who really wants to push japan and korea to be besties now and even within korea how do people feel about this latest development and really does this solve the trauma for the actual victims their families and their descendants it's a complicated issue but you know, for your friends who may not even know the difference between North Korea and South Korea, and then they didn't even know that Japan and Korea had beef with one another, well, I'm going to give you a roadmap on how to explain this totally complex and historical frenemy, ally, enemy, now bestie sort of relationship. And remember to upgrade your game in the skincare category by not even using skincare products on your face, but using beauty technology from Korea. LED lights, all made here in Korea. And guess what? Yeah, you might have noticed the box is a little bit different because we've had a mid-cycle upgrade on the gold color. So we're slowly rolling out the new version of the gold eco face mask. Remember, it's dual LED red light technology to increase the blood circulation, to get things going, get all of the gunk out of your skin from the, sur the not the surface level, but below into the dermis. And then also it activates your collagen factory so that you can actually look younger on the outside because you're getting younger on the inside. So all that coming up, so stay tuned. Okay, so what was the latest agreement that happened between Korea and Japan brokered by President Yoon? Essentially, he wants to put to bed this ongoing conflict over how to resolve forced labor of Koreans during, especially during World War II. So sort of like, how do you compensate people who had to be forced, because Germany did it as well. They forced people like in the concentration camps to also work for some very prominent German companies that still exist today to work in their wartime factories basically in Korea kidnapped them or recruited them through trickery and then essentially they were under basically they could not escape so they were forced labor did not get paid or if they were paid like the pittance and you know we have the uh, biggest name that you know now would be Mitsubishi and to a lesser extent still in existence Nippon Steel. Now, the Supreme Court in Korea several years ago said that, yep, 
this case by the uh, the the victims is valid and in a way they couldn't exactly 100% sue Japan and say like okay Japan you know compensate but that's what they wanted they, again just like the comfort women the forced sexual slavery issue they want an apology and they want compensation a heartfelt one from the Japanese government and in this case as well, they wanted to have compensation from the companies that were involved in Japan and then also from the Japanese government, a real apology. Now the complicate, and then so from that Supreme Court ruling, what they were able to do, at least in Korea, was to seize some assets that were still connected to those companies, you know, historically those companies that have, you know, done business throughout the decades and are still in Korea, they were able to seize some of the assets and then try to create some sort of compensation fund. But this agreement that Yoon suk Yeol did was to try to really put any further claims to rest because there are more victims coming out to try to uh, sue for damages and and, you know, understandably try to get some recompense for the pain and the trauma. Now, the controversial part of his agreement was that he kind of created this fund and said that Korean companies would pay for it and Japan, we would love it if Japanese companies and the Japanese government, if they would also contribute, but it's kind of voluntary so it well it is voluntary and so Japan and the Japanese companies are basically saying like thanks but no thanks and the Korean companies uh, especially POSCO which is a steel company and some other companies and I and I also heard that even some consortium of Korean businesses in the United States decided to contribute and they will then create a fund that would compensate the victims and then also create a future scholarship fund to uh, increase the uh, interaction between Japanese and Korean youth. Now the flowery language is that it's future-oriented cooperation between South Korea and Japan to help defend freedom, peace, and prosperity not only in South Korea and Japan but also around the world. So I would say on the list of priorities, usually when this kind of controversial thing comes up, especially when it's like a trilateral thing, the flowery thing, the thing that really doesn't really kind of grip is, is like the least on the list. The thing that came way down in the article about trying to improve ties to release some sort of blockages for the semiconductor industry, I think that is is essentially the road block. So let's just skip to the end and then work our way back. So essentially, Yoon suk Yeol doing this deal was kind of a big departure. Politically, it is not something that most Korean presidents would ever really do because it is a hot potato issue. And the way he did it, may, it looks like Korea is kind of like the sucker in this situation. He, the Korean people are paying for their own victimhood and to, you know, re, you know, compensate for their own uh, people in this situation. Although I do have a point about that. But of course, what I do like about this situation is that he did slide in there, hey, if we do this, then you need to release some of these restrictions from 2019 that, you know, y'all in Japan did to our semiconductor industry because there are some chemicals that come from Japan that Korea relies upon to make semiconductors. And if you haven't heard, Samsung has been losing billions of dollars recently in its semiconductor uh division so there probably could have been some pressure from samsung to kind of try to save our you know semiconductor industry because apparently it is still the biggest semiconductor company in the world and also samsung is the biggest conglomerate in south korea 
Now, that I think was kind of the sweetener, but also kind of the impetus to kind of drive Yoon Suk Yeol, the president of Korea, over the edge of any kind of political fallout because this is this is kind of like a big step for him. Of course, the United States is all gung ho, it doesn't care about any kind of you know, they just, just like, y'all just figure it out. Y'all figure it out. Because, you know, on paper, we are allies. You know, we, the United States, South Korea, Japan, in terms of a military defense system, basically against China, is always supposed to be together. So these internal rifts between Japan and Korea that constantly come up, kind of pisses off the United States because the United States is looking at like Japan and South Korea as like its strongest shields against North Korea, which is a buffer against big old China. And so they always, you know, like if there's any kind of move between like Japan and South Korea to get, you know, really get uh, along, they're just like, you know, always trumpeting that. And uh, and President Biden is just like, yes, 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 that's great. But the tricky part is that is that even in South Korea, there's 60 percent of the public that is against this deal because it does look like there's a lot of egg on Uh, South Korea's face. Now, the reason why the South Korean businesses were so quick to step up, you may ask, is that on the whole, South Korean businesses are not so innocent either. Because was there an apology? Let's back up here. What is Japan's biggest excuse, if you can call it an excuse? There was a treaty signed in 1965 between a president, uh, Park Jong-hee, you know, President Park Geun-hye's father, you know, the dictator. And it is debatable. He, his role in this is debatable because some people said it's really good and other people said that it was just done too hastily. Essentially, he just did like a shoop, shoop, like a real fast deal And for $500 million that Japan would pay South Korea for wartime reparations and as an apology for uh, doing all that bad stuff. And it was supposed to be kind of like a blanket, like, we're sorry, you know, this will cover everything. You know, let's just write one check and then also give you access to low interest loans. And so from Japan's side as a nation politically and then also down throughout the generations they're saying like yeah we apologize back in 1965 in 1965 you know we gave you 500 million dollars we gave you access to some loans and you know we set up that was supposed to be that's supposed to apologize for everything and everything and but the thing was is that more and more crap popped up you know we didn't know everything and more and more atrocities came up and not to mention during those decades in between you know there's still trying to get our you know they're still trying to make claims to our islands they're still trying they're still trying to you know pull a fast one here and there so it's always kind of like you know your neighbor just like oh it's always eye in your backyard or like you know trying to build his fence a little bit further and further into yours and you're you're always like are you really sorry about what you did and would you do it again so there is still this real thing in the back of Korean people's heads about like there most Korean people are not convinced that Japan given the right circumstances would not do it again but that's in general I think realpolitik you always have to keep your country strong because any kind of sign of weakness even your allies can turn into your invaders you know no matter where you are in the world it's just a thing of statehood and warcraft but from japan's perspective they apologized by this 500 million dollar uh check and that went towards businesses so where did that money go it's not as if they create you know the the dictator created a victim fund and went to try to find all the people who are crying and traumatized and try to you know uphold their life no he went into start investing in modernizing korea so that's where it's debatable because 
that money and that drive and that dictatorial direction he is credited by people who support him saying like well he cut a quick deal with japan got some cash and infused korea on a fast path towards modernization and he was able to pick up the industries that japan had built during colonial times and then also hand them out to korean businesses who either were already friendly with japan or people who are already friendly with japan because you know even though you colonized you always have the co-conspirators who will always you know side with the colonizers you know to get a stake or two every now and then and to get a business here and to get some land here or there and then you know get your kids into good schools and stuff you'll always have people you know working for the oppressor and internally that has been a very uh like strong it was almost like fault lines here in korea like it's it ruptures into earthquakes but it's kind of quiet underneath the surface and uh, you know people here in korea call them chinilpa korean people who are aligned with japan and generally those people if and that's a derogatory term if you don't think of them as derogatory the the people who are uh who were able to uh, seize some of the assets of Japanese businesses and then create, you know, these big conglomerates. So that's why, you know, I think POSCO was just like, you know, quick to be like, yep, we'll contribute to this uh, victim's fund. No problem. <laughs> we'll contribute. And that's, I think, part of that. And so in a way, I think that that was, I don't know if President Yoon suk yeol was uh, an idiot savant but what I do think, and I don't think it's talked enough, uh, enough, but I think in one way that is good, that at least Korea internally is acknowledging that there were winners from that horrible situation, that apology money went to people who probably weren't traumatized and benefited them and then made them rich. So why not have them contribute and pay? Also, I think it really does show the government of Korea, at least, is making a strong stance that we are going to take care of you. If we so sort of like a parent, like, you know, if if a, the kid gets beat up by somebody else, and if their parents don't apologize, their kid doesn't apologize, at least the parent is saying like, well, I will take care of you. Now, of course, there are Korean people here and some will even use it uh, politically against uh, Yoon suk yeol saying like this is an embarrassment because you're basically conceding to the Japanese. And, you know, of course, there is an argument to be made there. But... I do understand how this does at least bring the Korean government and the businesses who did benefit from that to acknowledge it, e even if it's indirectly, to say that we will take care of Koreans because at least we can do that for ourselves. Because when you really think about it, after 1965, when all this money had been spent and didn't go to any of the victims, how betrayed would you feel not only by the colonizers and what just happened to you, but also by your own country who just literally just ignored you and said, like, just forget it. You know, we're just going to modernize, you know, like enjoy the freeway, enjoy the subway. You know, now you can, you know, have, you know, steel frames on your apartment building and con concrete so you know just suck it up and i think for a while i think korean people maybe can try that but you can see now these are old people who have probably tried everything and they're still traumatized and they're still looking for like a simple real heartfelt apology and this is a this is why i think in a weird way, this agreement, even though I think it is, 
it needs to be delicately handled because you know you don't want it to look like you've capitulated you do not want it to look like oh well you know i guess well we gave you that for free you know come and get another but i do think it is a start to perhaps try to get perhaps the korean public and the victims to realize that an apology ain't ever coming an apology i don't think is ever going to come because if you look at the comfort woman issue many of them have passed away an apology never came every wednesday they are protesting outside the japanese embassy here in seoul they've set up movements around the world apology never ever came of course there was some statements here or there but it was never officially acknowledged as like an official apology apology and i don't in one way you know i've seen some old school koreans and even new school koreans they don't apologize they don't apologize what for what they did like two minutes ago they don't apologize what they did two weeks ago two months ago maybe even two centuries ago so why do you think another country who obviously is you know feels very guilty for what they did is going to apologize in that kind of situation especially when they got the excuse that oh we apologize in 1965 and then but it's kind of like a one and done. That's the thing that peop that I think Korean people are a little bit like, you know, really pissed off about. Because if you look at Germany's case, they apologize, they apologize, they, 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 and then the actions are continuous through the generations. They have education programs and they, they, they really try to stamp down the whole Nazi past and they're, they're, actions and their it's all in there uh, it's everything but it kind of seems like in japan diplomatically it's always just like oh yeah remember 1965 yeah 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 we yeah we covered that why why are you bring that up again and so i think now i think korean people just really may have to come to terms with an apology that's never gonna come and especially if you rely on the government to try to get you this win or this apology or this acknowledgement, that is just a road to nowhere. But I got you covered. I have the soul light plan, okay? Because you know what? If you can't rely on the government and you have to rely on yourself and you have to just rely on your crew, hey, we got everything we need to put it back into our own hands. This is my proposal for this and also even the comfort woman issue if they still want to uh, extend it to that. But if it's just about the forced labor victims, I think they need to set up an accountability committee, make the, the committee sound very official. And it's completely run by non-government officials, but with help from government to access information, but basically to compile publicly available information. Then there's two subcommittees, a revenge subcommittee and a peace subcommittee. And if you are a victim or a, fan, a, re, or a, fa a family member, or anybody affected by this and you can't get your apology, but you can get some sort of compensation from the fund that Korea has created, but you're still needing something. I think for the rest of your life, you can go from revenge subcommittee or peace subcommittee, whichever suits your fancy, because that is just, you know, your own path. So I think on the peace subcommittee, you know, you try to get people to understand the meaning of forgiveness and what it does for you rather than for the other person, discover the nature of forgiveness and how it's a healing for you and how revenge and grudges only hold you back and poison your own life and you just, you know, like steps to try to heal from the trauma. But you know what? Sometimes that just doesn't work and you just want good old-fashioned revenge. And so I think that the revenge subcommittee 
perhaps can fill that role where, first of all, the caveat should be made that if you go down this path of revenge, you may have to dig two graves because the famous saying, right, I think it's Confucius, you know, you may kill your enemy, but you may kill yourself in the process. But hey, some people, they may want to go out with a bang. I mean, that's how they might want to go out. And I think Part of this should just be a simple, simple access to information. Get a list of the current board of directors of these companies that won't apologize, won't give compensation. You know, the, the Japanese companies, the board of directors, the family members, everybody associated with them, you know, all contact points. And, you know, we can do that now with just probably publicly inform, you know, public information or the web. And then get the current list of government officials who also won't apologize or are putting in roadblocks or saying like, oh, you know, well, 1965, remember that? And all their family members and things like that. And just give it to the revenge subcommittee. Now, I'm not saying people should do anything bad, but... You never know what people are going to do. And I think in terms of these types of situations, it's more of the threat that it may spark some sort of reaction or it can kind of give, a, a, you know, an impetus to, well, let's just put it that way. You know, you know, information is power. Let's just put it that way. And then a bonus. You know, all those people in America who hate Asian people, I would say this fund should set up, set aside or get a, you know, get some sponsorship from like Korean Air and Asiana Airlines and sponsor free trips to Japan by these people who hate Asian people and give them this list as well and say like, hey, you can get your free, um, you know, free hotel and accommodations if you find these people and do whatnot. And perhaps they'll end up in Japanese jail and then they'll stay out of America, you know, stop bothering Asian Americans. They can see how life is in, in Japanese prison and get their karma. And I mean, wouldn't it be just a win win? I don't think that the solution is ever going to be asking for an apology from somebody who thinks that they don't ever have to apologize or that they already did and it was way enough they're never ever ever going to apologize however i will say i would predict i mean if they actually enacted my accountability committee with its revenge subcommittee and peace subcommittee that perhaps Somehow, magically, apologies will be pouring out of the sky, but I don't think they'll be heartfelt. I think there'll be some panic driving those apologies. All right, guys. Well, what do you think? I mean, it, it's a complicated issue, but on the whole, the actual citizens between Japan and Korea, we like each other. And we always, I mean, we're always traveling back and forth for tourism between the two countries. The cultures are, you know, very much um, compatible. And it's just a trust issue. It's just a long term trust issue, which I think any neighboring countries should always have it's not just a japan and korea issue although because of its history and because what happened in korea by japan was so egregious it does take a bit more to regain that trust and i would still say that you know it is very it's abundantly clear that even generations later the trust, the trauma has not been healed. And I think now it's it's time for people to try to heal themselves and not depend on an apology that will never come and find their own way. Choose peace or revenge, but keep the power in your own hands and always put the power of choice within yourself rather than in the Korean government or the Japanese government or some 
other agency, bring it back to yourself. And I think no matter what happens, I think they can heal from that. All right, guys, well, put your comments below and remember to like, share and subscribe and we'll see you again next time. Bye bye.